to prune or not to prune? That is a question Hamlet or Shakespeare would be asking this time of the year if they had a perennial garden. We'll try to answer it on today's show. Thanks for tuning in. The Gardening Simplified Show coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. All right, Stacy. fall's the time of year when many people clean up their garden beds in preparation for winter. And well, there's a few guidelines that you want to follow. And we've been asked by our viewers and listeners to touch on the subject. So let's do that. I would say right off the bat, an easy general rule of thumb, a rule of green thumb, at least it's what I apply, is after a few frosts, if the stalks are nice and sturdy, and stout like ornamental grasses, I don't prune them. If it turns to slime, for lack of a better word, maybe you've got a better word for me, then I prune it, clean it, discard it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a a good standpoint. So something like a hosta, just kind of like blah, Blah, you know. Blah (laughs) or slime, either of those. Yeah, Uh, I mean, yeah, they just (laughs) kind of disappear or they just kind of melt into the ground. Um, And, you know, I think it's interesting for for many years, people approached fall cleanup as like, you've got to make it barren. You got to take everything away. And I'm really happy that over the past couple of years, there's been a real change toward leaving more of your garden intact for fall. No, not out of laziness, but uh, because it's so beneficial to overwintering insects and other animals. And so I am a big, big, big believer in leaving uh, everything in fall. And I do all my, my cleanup in late spring. I love that. So when we're talking about perennials like bee balm or phlox or Stacy mentioned hostas or peonies, and there was some disease or spotting of the foliage, maybe powdery mildew. And like I said, they turn to slime, clean it all up and clean it up good. But there are some that you want to um, maybe keep intact for the winter period. Some produce great seed heads. Stacy, you've talked in the past about baptisia or oh, false yeah. indigo. There, of course, are ornamental grasses. The birds love the inflorescence, the dried inflorescence, and cone flowers or echinacea, uh, leaving them standing also to help feed the birds. So uh, you can leave some perennials up and leave some of those chores to spring. Now, The ones that you do want to cut back, first of all, if there are some perennials that you don't want to reseed in your garden. Definitely. You may want to cut those back. Or at least deadhead them. You know, you don't necessarily need to take them all the way back to the ground if you like the way the plant looks. Um, But it is simple enough to just snap those seed heads off and discard them and and minimize seed spreading. That's, you know, we've talked about self-sowers before. That's something that I deal with with some plants that I do think look really beautiful in winter, but I can't risk them spreading. Like, for example, my beautiful bronze fennel. Ah, yes. (laughs) So that one definitely gets deadheaded. That's a great point. Uh, Cut back perennials with diseased foliage, powdery mildew, rust, or leaf spot dispose of them, or perennials that have insect damage. Let's say the hosta leaves are really holy. Get rid of them. Yeah. Right? Discard them. Uh, Because uh, we want to make sure to do clean up there. Do not cut these back. There are some perennials you don't want to cut back, like coral bells, heuchera. That's that's one that really throws people for a loop. They're not sure what to do because the foliage doesn't look amazing, but it doesn't look bad either. Uh, And, you know, I think that kind of leads to, I know you're going to give a list of other things that you shouldn't prune or cut back. But I think it bears repeating multiple times through the show. When in doubt, don't prune. If you're not sure... You know, should I cut this back? Don't cut it back. (laughs) Just put the pruners down and walk away. Uh, You're going to be able to repair the damage a lot. You know, you're going to be able to fix it if you don't prune it than if you prune it and then, you know, potentially cause harm. So when in doubt, don't prune. This goes for spring cleanup. It goes, or for fall cleanup, it goes for spring cleanup. It goes for any kind of pruning. When in doubt, don't prune. Put those pruners down, walk away. I think it's, and nobody gets hurt. <laughs> exactly. I think that's a good approach, Stacy. I really do. And you know, it does bring up a great point. There's controversy uh, amongst people who have a perennial garden as it relates to perennial hibiscus. Some people believe you should not prune them back in fall because it's hollowed stem. You're going to get rotting. You should prune them in spring. Other people prune them in fall, just leave a little stubble. We're good to go. 
Well, you know, I, I everyone I think knows how much I adore my yeah, perennial that's hibiscus. That's why I bring it up. <laughs> and so I do both. Uh, now, you know, I think one thing um, that's important too in this conversation is, you know, we all garden in the real world. So sometimes we can take what we know is best advice and we have to apply it based on the way things actually work in our own yard. So sure. for example, where my main bed of Baptisia and perennial hibiscus are is an area where we have to pile up snow because it's right surrounding my back porch and we don't want to, you know, be shoveling snow. There's nothing worse than like you get the shovel and then you hit something and oh, it's so frustrating. It's like giving me chills even thinking about it. Um, and so we cut those back because we need that area clear so we can pile up all the snow that we remove from our back porch area. But in my garden, I leave them all standing. So sometimes you have to do what you have to do, you know, based on what's actually happening. And then sometimes you can, you know, leave things to be. And you may not have to shovel that snow this winter. Oof, Stay tuned to Branching speaking my News. language. I'm going to share some information <laughs> with you on that. Uh, yeah, so maybe leave some of the perennials up that have winter interest. Of course, you do not want to cut back lavender. Let's wait until spring for that. Uh, or even, in my opinion, woody shrubs that act like perennials, like Budlea, yep. I like to wait until spring. Do you wait until spring? Definitely. And we're going to cover that in today's Plant on Trial, which is not a Budlea. But, um, you know, anything, any perennials or sub shrubs like that, Lavender is another great example. Rosemary that is likely to get winter damage in your climate should not be pruned until spring because leaving that plant intact helps to protect buds lower down on the plant. It, having that extra plant body there can go a long way. And then in spring, when it starts to grow, it tells you where to cut it. It's yeah, pretty simple. Exactly. So hold off on the lavender. That's a question a lot of people will ask. And again, I go back to the very first rule of green thumb that I put forth, at least in my opinion. If it's stout, it's woody, it's sturdy, eh, let it go. If it's slimy, cut it, clean it, get rid of it. It's time for a limerick on this topic. It's my perennial pruning paradigm before the foliage turns to slime. With their year-end curtain call, I follow my favored protocol, goodbye daylight saving time. Oh, boy. <laughs> I put you to bed by the moonlight. I tuck you in. Sleep tight. I clip my daisies, hosta, and yarrow. Oh, parting is such sweet, sweet sorrow. Good night, my dear friends. Good night. Ah. Yeah, kind of brings a tear to my eye. You know, it's very sweet. I didn't know if you were talking about your plants or your grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if it's bone dry this fall, make sure these perennials do not go into winter uh, dry. Uh, then you may want to apply some mulch or if they're newly planted so they don't heave out of the ground. Mulch may be a good idea, but if they're well-established plant, uh, too mulch of a good thing also can be bad. In other words, we don't want the roots soaking wet nope. uh, over winter. You know, two to three inches is my general guideline that I give to people. There are some exceptions, again, going back to things that need really good drainage in fall, like butterfly bush, uh, Perovskia, Russian sage, lavender is another good example. There you go. All those things are best left lightly or unmulched, at least, you know, real close to the actual stem um, but everything else i do like to have a good two to three inch layer of shredded bark mulch it's it's good for conserving moisture it's good for adding organic matter to the soil it's a win-win situation pruning iris in fall necessary because of iris borer i think really good cleanup as far as iris is concerned on past shows we talked about mums putting a light layer of mulch over top of them so that they don't heave out of the ground so that they come back again next year also and then remember there are some perennials that start to show new growth even before the new season begins sedum nepeta Hellebores are all yeah. examples of that, so don't be surprised if that happens. And then finally, in your perennial bed, as you're doing cleanup and pruning, remember fall is the perfect time for weed control to deal with that competition with your perennials. I do most of my weed control surrounding my perennials during the fall season. That's a good idea, unless the weeds have already disappeared. <laughs> then you're in trouble then you're, but you know the nice thing too is when you're working there's seed about that those weeds spread and the birds are super hungry and foraging very actively and they'll eat those weed seeds they do you a huge favor so it's a good time to uh to let them do their thing and bear in mind in this fall season if you buy some bargain plants 
and uh, you don't have any place to put them yet. Just sink the pots in the ground, chop the tops, and uh, we'll deal with them next spring and find a nice new home for them. Yeah, that's true. You don't have to get it all in the ground. You, you should, but you don't have to. Coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show, we're going to put a plant on trial. Don't miss this one. It's a favorite of mine. They're all favorites, but it's a favorite of mine. That's next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. We're going to put a plant on trial. It is a good plant for today's topic, as I always try to tie them in, however tenuously, uh, to the day's topic. But, you know, before I launch into that, I do briefly just want to clarify, everything we were just talking about is primarily uh, applicable to perennials, herbaceous perennials. Herbaceous perennials are those that are going to come back from the ground, from their roots, in spring. And that's a difference between uh, a, a shrub. A shrub is a woody plant that persists above ground and the growth for the season comes out on those branches above ground. It might also come from the roots, but the, it, the important thing is those branches above ground are going to host the growth going forward. So all, everything that we just said, you do that doesn't apply to shrubs because if you go and cr- cut your shrubs back to the right. ground, you're not going to have much left and it will have to reinvent itself every single single year as a herbaceous plant rather than as a sturdy woody plant so there's a lot more to know about the difference between herbaceous perennials and shrubs but it all comes down to what i said in the first segment which is when in doubt don't prune so just that's the main thing you need to know going into fall and the future whatever your gardening quandary is when in doubt just don't well said (laughs) well said I've learned that the hard way. (laughs) Uh, But today's plant on trial is one that is actually a shrub, but many people actually think of it as a perennial, and you'll very often find it in the garden center along with the perennials, even though it is a true shrub that makes true wood, and that is Beyond Midnight Caryopteris. Mm, Love it. Now, Caryopteris is also known uh, as Bloomist Spirea, which not, makes no sense to me because it's no not sense. a spirea. I mean, it does kind of have a misty blue oh. vibe to it, but it is not a spirea, not even remotely related to spirea. Um, and I don't think even really looks like one, but no. <laughs> in any case, we didn't give it that name. And then the other one is Bluebeard. And that's the one I tend to hear more often, but I personally like Caryopteris because I think both of those other common names are just kind of weird. Yeah, and Caryopteris is fun to say. Yes, it means um, split wing. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, referring to the seed. But anyway, uh, so Beyond Midnight, um, like I said, it's a, it's a true shrub, but it does benefit from being cut back, although in spring, not in fall. So this is a, the type of plant that you're going to treat like a butterfly bush. So if you grow butterfly bush, you've already kind of got the the schedule in mind. You've got the, the plan, the blueprint for success in mind. Uh, and it's similar to butterfly bush as well in that it uh, needs to be, uh, it's best if you leave it intact over winter because that will help to protect the lower buds. And this is a plant that sometimes, especially if you live in USDA zone five, it's hard to USDA zone five through nine. Um, and you have clay soil that tends to be kind of mm-hmm. wet in the winter and, and cold and clammy. That is the death knell, just like it is for butterfly bush. That's the death knell for, for Caryopteris. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I do want to paint the picture here of this beautiful plant, which Rick said is one of his favorites. I really enjoy it too. Uh, so because two of its common names do have the word blue in them, you might be thinking it has something about it that's blue, and that is true. Now, I do think that Beyond Midnight, uh, the particular variety that we are putting on trial right now, uh, is more blue than average. And it's it's a funny thing. When you look at the whole plant, I think it very much uh, gives off the appearance of blue. But when you look at an individual floret or flower, it's kind of purple. But the, I, I find the whole picture looks rather blue, especially because Beyond Midnight, one of the reasons we call it Beyond Midnight, is it has very, very dark green foliage. Okay. And that makes a really, really nice contrast with, uh, with those purpley blue flowers. Now, another thing, though, that I think is truly blue about this plant that a lot of people fail to even notice is that after the flowers fall, that little bract that held them, that turns a true blue color. 
Now, it's, have you noticed that before? Yeah, yeah, I have. It's really nice. And I, I was going to say, this plant, to me, my eyes, is true blue. Oh, good. It's true blue. Because, you know, sometimes people will call you out I for it, and know. they'll say, that's not blue to me. It's not blue. And we do have it's the blue. existence of horticultural <laughs> blue. Um, but, yeah, I do find it to be a true blue as well. So, um, it and the cool thing about it is that it flowers in fall. It's flowering at peak right now, and it just comes out with these... Um, really elegant spikes of whiskered blue flowers. I think that's where Bluebeard comes from because the flowers do kind of have a whiskery type yeah. look. And they're in these little tiers up and down the stem. Um, so they have a lot of space. You know, I like plants with some space in them. Uh, and boy, do they attract pollinators. Yeah, uh, it's unreal. Butterflies and bees. By the way, if you're keeping score at home, you want to Google this or use the search engine of your choice. Stacy's talking about Beyond Midnight Caryopteris, Caryopteris, and yes, uh, Stacy, alive with bees and butterflies. I hope that's not intimidating anyone, because it is a sight to see, and it is just fantastic. It's it, incredible. It brings a smile to your face because you just know it's like this font of nutrition for all of our little visitors who are either going to go dormant or migrate or whatever they're going to do. They need to beef up on all this nectar that this plant offers. I've walked up to Caryopteris and done the Frankenstein thing. It's alive. <laughs> I mean, the whole bush is vibrating. Yes. You know? And you can which, actually hear it. Which, by the way, it really bugs me. Uh, in the novel, Frankenstein is Victor. In the 1931 movie, he's Henry, and in Young Frankenstein, he's Frederick Frankenstein. How can that be? That has always bothered me. Well, you know, it's. I think it's interesting you say that because the more pedantic uh, response that most people have to Frankenstein <laughs> is that the monster is not Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein's monster. So they're not even hung up on the first exactly. name issue. It's they're the already doctor, freaking out the about the fact that the, that the monster itself who never asked to come into being, by the way, is not Frankenstein. He is Frankenstein's monster. So there's a lot of people who are very pedantic about that. So you're the first I've come across who are pedantic about the first name. I'm sorry I've sidetracked us. <laughs> Back to carry Well, optics. you know, yeah, we're, know, we're about a month away from Halloween or right. a couple weeks away from Halloween. So <laughs> fair enough. You but know, you are like, correct. Butterflies and bees all over the plant. Yes. And uh, I have a former colleague of mine used to call Caryopteris the Bumblebee Motel. Oh, I love that. Yeah. They're the Bumblebee apartment building because they are just all over it. And, you know, bumblebees are, are not something that people freak out about. Yes, it will attract honeybees, but it's a, this is a good plant and they're not going to bother you. Why? Because they're so happy to be eating this marvelous treat that you have planted for them. Uh, so to go back to caring for it. Now, this is another thing that it has in common with butterfly bush, full sun. This is yes. a full, full sun plant. You aren't going to want to give it any less than six hours of bright sun each day. Uh, we do have excellent luck with it out here uh, on the lake shore where our soil is very sandy. It's a plant that needs good drainage. So if you have clay soil and you want to grow it, you can. But I would not recommend planting it in fall, which is a hard thing because this is when you're going to see it and want it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of plants that get that are susceptible to winter damage are not very good planted in fall because they don't have enough time That's to develop point. the root system to help them withstand all the challenges that are coming ahead in winter, even if it is a mild winter. And for things like Caryopteris, it might be especially problematic if it's a mild winter because then the soil doesn't really freeze. It just sits around and is cold and wet, especially if it's clay. And again, that is the death knell for both Caryopteris mm. and butterfly bush, as well as Russian sage, if you have tried to grow that. But if you are going to plant it and you don't have perfect drainage, this is a plant you're going to want to plant high or slightly above the soil line rather than even with and certainly not below the soil line that will help the drainage a lot. So even if you go to the garden center and see it looking fabulous, unless you get a great deal and you're willing to kind of roll the dice maybe a little bit, this is one if you're in USDA zone five or six, I would recommend trying to wait until spring to to plant. If you love these wonderful varieties of buddleia or butterfly bush, then Stacy, I would agree this may be the plant for you. Listening to you talk needs good drainage. Deer and rabbit resistant. Oh, very, yeah. Like sunshine, right? It's a woody plant that we almost treat like a perennial. They're very similar. They're very similar. And so I think it's something if you feel like, hey, I love butterfly bush, but what's next? Or I've got the butterfly bush thing down. Yeah. This is a great plant to just add to your collection. Now, this plant actually did come to us from Israel. From oh, Danziger wow. Flower Farm. Wow. Uh, so that is another thing that speaks to its ability to, you know, 
uh, like good drainage, tolerate the heat without a problem, and love the sunshine. And I've talked so much about it that I can't continue, <laughs> and I'm going to leave the rest up to you. Uh, since it's plant on trial, you get to decide if you're going to add it to your garden by visiting Gardening Simplified on air.com or, of course, our Instagram page, Gardening Simplified Show. And you will see pictures of it there. Learn everything that you need to know. And of course, if you have questions about it, we can help you. You can leave a comment on our YouTube video. But this, um, I think, is a great plant. I have it in my garden. Like you said, very deer and rabbit resistant. Great fragrance coming from it. A great pollinator attractant. And just that that blue color. Fragrance, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. That blue color is just really unexpected and really fun to see in the fall landscape. So there's my case for Beyond Midnight Caryopteris. We're going to take a little bit of a break, but when we come back, we've got answers to your gardening questions. So please stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's uh, pretty much my favorite time of the show when we get to answer your questions about what's going on in your garden, what you don't know about, what you're wondering, um, and, you know, have you ever been stumped by a garden question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because plants are weird. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that gets my stump of approval. <laughs> you know, people think that we have all the answers, and we don't. What we have, fortunately, is a wide breadth of experience. It's the illusion. <laughs> it, it, I, I hope it's more than an illusion. <laughs> I, I really do. Um, but no, I mean, gardening is about experience, yeah. and um, you are able to answer more garden questions and give more meaningful answers when you've had that experience of caring for plants and learning things yourself, and then you are able to apply that. And so that's what I always try to do uh, to help people. And our first question in the garden mailbag is one that has me a little bit stumped. I'm going to, I'm going to, when you get to asking it, I'll, I'll talk about why it's a bit of a stumper, but um, I do want to say, first of all, if you have a garden question, we're always happy to help. You can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardening simplified on air.com, or just go to gardening simplified on air.com. There's a contact form. Uh, we do value everybody's questions, but we only have time for three in every episode, unless we do another special bonus episode. Um, so if you have an urgent question and you're like, I don't know what to do. Well, first of all, remember when in doubt, don't prune. And second of all, um, you can always uh, leave a comment on our YouTube video or uh, visit the Proven Winners website, provenwinners.com. There's a feedback form there and I am answering all the questions there every single day. So uh, I answer a lot of questions. I'm, I'm deep in question land. So what's, uh, what's on deck today? Well, this stumper comes from Sharon. She writes, we have a blue rose of Sharon that has an abundance of buds since August, but none have opened up. That's a problem. While the buds are pretty, we would like blooms. What are we doing wrong? It's planted in full sun. It's been watered regularly. We're in zone five, northwest Iowa. So, you know, I have heard this question from a lot of gardeners, so as I'm sure I. you have. All the time. And the tricky thing about Roses of Sharon is that their buds and their seed pods look very similar mm -hmm. to, to, to someone. Um, they have the same shape and the buds are a little bit smaller than the seed pod. And once you know the difference, it's, it's pretty easy to tell. And I've definitely heard from lots of people who say, hey, my Rose of Sharon bloomed beautifully, but now it's just got a bunch of buds that won't open. And so that's the number one reason that, that I've heard of this. Um, and usually they, you know, I say, hey, all you have to do to check is just get your pruners, cut it open. If you see something colorful in there, then you're right. It's a flower bud. And if instead you see a bunch of big, round, white seeds that look kind of like okra, then what you have is a seed pod and the flowers already open and, and you miss them. But I did have a gardener uh, this season on the Proven Winners website who wrote me and um, sh she didn't have a Proven Winners, just a Rose of Sharon, but she had a Rose of Sharon that over the past couple of years truly has stopped blooming. Um, it just, you know, and she, she sent me pictures, you know, trying to rule out that it was not this bud thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just not, it sets flowers and they never open. And we went back and forth and I was doing research and, you know, tearing up the internet, trying to find something. It turns out there is a midge. A midge is like a teeny tiny little fly that, um, can go into the buds and it will prevent them from opening. 
Um, now, it's a little too late. If, if midges were indeed the issue, and this wasn't just a, a, a seed pod issue, which, like I said, very easy to resolve. Just take your pruners, cut one open, see what you see. Um, and then, you know, that will definitely give you an answer. If you see colorful petals, then you know it was a flower bud. And if you don't, then it was a seed pod. Um, but it is easy to check, and it would be too late at this point because the midges would have moved on. But put it in a plastic bag and seal it and then put it like on top of your fridge or put it in a warm spot somewhere indoors and then check it in say two or three days. Mm. And if the little bugs are in there, you will see them because otherwise they're very tiny. You still might need like a hand lens or, or something to see them if you don't have good eyes. But um, that is, is one thing now. I, so really the, the answer to, to Sharon's question is again, are you sure they're not buds yeah, or seed pods? From my experience with Rose of Sharon, it's a plant that reacts to stress, some sort of stress. Could be an insect, could be drought, too much water, shade, whatever it may be. Doesn't kill the plant, but it reacts by aborting the blooms. Yeah. I have found that also. Uh, and then the plant just goes abort, abort. Yeah. You know, like Not an putting the energy abort. into to opening these flowers and just dropping them. Which if I was an astronaut and I was in the capsule, that's the first button I would look for. <laughs> That abort, I want to know where that thing is. Anyhow, uh, I have also found if they're being watered over the top with a sprinkler. Mm. Uh, and then one other quick thing on Rose of Sharon, and that is my opinion, Stacy. I don't know if you agree, but I think that's a plant who needs to be shown who's boss. In other words, a good pruning every year. My mm. opinion. That's what I think. I think it does depend on how big it is. Um, if you don't prune ev Rose of Sharon ever, they get kind of weak stemmed. Right. So some pruning is definitely a good idea yeah, and they get really big. Um, right. But anyway, Sharon, cut open your buds or what looks like buds and let us know what you find and we can go from there. So what's next? Uh, Michelle asks, what is it this year that has made the pine trees drop so much sap? My pine cones are glistening with it. This is the first year I've ever experienced this that I can remember. My driveway is covered in sap. It seemed to start right after this past tornado storm system went through about a month ago. Yeah, and so Michelle's in Michigan, so we did have some tornadoes uh, back in sort of mid to late August. And um, so a couple of things, Michelle. I, I don't necessarily know that it was not a coincidence about the tornado. And I'm wondering if there was maybe some breakage within mm. the tree mm. that you can't necessarily see. It's not leaving a big old hanging branch, um, but something that cracked and is maybe, you know, letting the sap flow because it's not normal for really heavy sap flow in fall. Spring, absolutely. Yes. Um, but it's not typical in fall. So I would say, you know, try to trace back the origin of the sap. You know, if you can look up in the in the plant, in the tree, maybe even bring up a pair of binoculars so you can really get a good look and see if there is a source in there that maybe indicates that there was some breakage higher up in the tree that you can't really tell is broken. Now, the other thing is bark beetles. Yes. So there's a number of bark beetles that uh, pines that are susceptible that pines are susceptible to, and they feed into in the plant. They go under the bark, and the pine tree's uh, response to that is try to flood them out with sap, um, and that is only successful to some degree or another. But that might be another reason why you are seeing so much sap. So um, we'll put some links for you on the on the website. Um, increased woodpecker activity is mm. another good sign that you might have some sort of insect issue that's causing the sap flow. One of my suggestions would be too throughout the years with people asking a question like this and uh, uh, Michelle, I'm sure you're right. However, m people loosely use the term pine. Ah, uh, that's true. You're, Let's you're right. identify the cultivar. Many times people will say to me, I'm having a problem with my pine tree. I stopped to check. It's a spruce. Yep, that's true. Or a true. Colorado spruce. So let's identify it closely. Don't loosely uh, use that term. There are other issues like scale and you'll get honeydew and it's sticky. Uh, so um, you, there's detective work that has to be done yeah, that, in, you in know, something like I'm this. glad you said that because that's true. And spruces do have a lot of different diseases exactly. that cause a lot of sap to flow out. So... Uh, Michelle, don't hesitate to send us a photo. We'll keep our eyes out for that and see if we can help you get to the bottom of your issue. Stacy Shannon's writing to us. I'm in zone 4B5, northwest Iowa. I have three tiny tough stuff hydrangeas. They all have dark spots on the leaves. Is this something I should worry about? 
boy, is this the season for this question yes. or what? Um, so no, it's probably not something that you should worry about. I know I didn't see a picture of it. Um, so two things about, about leaf spots. Number one is I think it's so important that people understand when a plant has a leaf spot disease, it's not in the plant, it's mm -hmm. on the plant. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not like, oh, my plant has this deadly disease and it's never going to recover. You can actually pretty easily help to control the disease by simply cleaning up the foliage because all those fungal spores will uh, overwinter on that fallen leaf. And then next spring, when that leaf comes out, it doesn't have that protective waxy cuticle yet. Very easy for the fungus Great point. to reinfect if, if that is the problem. So most fungal leaf spots, not the prettiest thing, but not super harmful for your plant. But at this time of year, being, you know, in autumn, um, plants are translocating their chlorophyll. And so they're going to turn color. And when they translocate their chlorophyll to store it for winter, sometimes that can reveal all sorts of crazy stuff that you never saw all through the season. And now it's like, whoa, there's purple spots all over my hydrangea. Um, but again, maybe it's a disease, maybe it's not. As long as your hydrangea is overall healthy, not dropping foliage, it's not a cause for concern. I think you hit the nail on the head. Last thing you want to do is a revenge spraying of a fungicide or whatever. You well, just don't want to do that. No, and especially it's because for the most part, when you um, are spraying something because it has leaf spot, it's too late. Yeah, exactly. You, for most fungicides for home use do yeah. need to be preventative in nature. So uh, that's what we got. If you want to ask us a question, again, gardening simplified on air.com. We're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we come back, Rick has got our branching news stories. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And Stacy, the news right now is that in the uh, Midwest, in the North, we uh, and even into the South, we are experiencing an oak mast year m-a-s-t a time of year when uh, the time of year when oaks will produce just a tremendous amount of uh, of acorns and what is an acorn well it's an oak tree in a nutshell i guess is what i would say but uh, it happens every three to five years some people say well it's a predictor of winter weather a farmer's almanac kind of thing it's going to be a tough winter i don't buy that at all there's many people who do not buy that some people do uh, oak trees just tend every three to five years to produce an abundant amount of acorns uh, the squirrels feast on it next year plan on all kinds of little baby squirrels Aww. and lots of squirrels in the landscape and then the sad thing is uh, then the oak trees won't have a mashed year and the populations will crash but regardless i don't want to throw a wet blanket on this uh it's a mashed year at least they're talking about it and and we record this show in michigan and there's something in the air this fall. We Number one, we have an omega block going on. It's a, a weather term for uh, this dome of high pressure over Michigan. So in October, we're getting summer-like temperatures. We have this oak mast. We have the fall moon, uh, the full moon this past week. And we have flamingos in Lake Michigan that got off course and hanging out. in. It's just weird. You know, some strange. people some people think we live in a simulation, and I think you listed a, a good, uh, you know, some evidence that that is perhaps true. But did you know that the, the term last year does specifically reply to apply to nuts, trees that bear nuts, but all trees, flowering trees, um, do have good years and bad years. Yeah, exactly. And people don't realize that. They say, oh, my, you know, crab apple or whatever was so beautiful this year, and you know, then it wasn't so great, and that's totally normal. Some years. They're just amazing, and it just that's just how it goes. Yeah, so the acorns are raining in my neighborhood, bouncing off the roof, uh, keeping people awake at night during this oak mass. And I brought along for our YouTube viewers, yes, a whole container here of acorns that I just picked up in a small area. And the acorns are kind of small, and I wondered, Stacy, if it was due to the fact that we've experienced periods of drought over this past year. I don't know. It's just a guess on my part. But there's no question that people in communities from Minnesota to Tennessee are experiencing an oak mast year. Um, I think it, in this case, since they are so consistent, the issue is just the species of oak that you have. Okay. That's yeah. my that's my. Point. And I would agree with you. Many of them are northern red oak. Of course, white oak, you get a little bigger acorn. I so love yes. white oak. It's one of my favorite trees. Yeah, so it varies from species, and you're right about that. 
All right, uh, story time. I got to share a story with you. You're okay. not going to throw one of those acorns. No, I was going to see right? if I could whistle it. I'll try after the show. Oh. Have you ever done that? That was bad. All oh, right. yeah. I'll practice up. We'll see what we can do. You practice on that. <laughs> That's fabulous. You keep that up, and at some t- at some point, the squirrels will be watching you on Netflix. <laughs> All right, uh, where was it? Oh, I got a story that I got to share with you, Stacy. I've been anxious to share this story with you. Okay. As you know, I do a little bit of work in my retirement at a greenhouse. Yes. And last weekend, we had a big sale, and within that sale were Let's Dance Proven Winners hydrangeas. Love that. Gorgeous plants. And I mean gorgeous. Okay. Now we also sell sweet corn at the greenhouse. Well, a lady came in and uh, she popped in real quickly because she saw on the sign that we had sweet corn. So she was just going to pick up a few years of sweet corn. And then she saw the Let's Dance hydrangeas, which are gorgeous and on sale. She couldn't help herself. Oh, who could? She put three of them on her shopping cart. Okay. So... Now she has a dilemma. Her husband's in the truck in the parking lot, and he expects her to come out with sweet corn. Um, And she decided to impulsively buy these Let's Dance hydrangeas. And she recognized me from the Gardening Simplified show. And so she asked me to go out to the truck and talk to her husband and kind of settle things down before she emerged from the garden center with her Let's Dance Hydrangeas. She asked you to be a decoy? Well, no, (laughs) she just wanted me to negotiate. This Uh. was almost like a hostage situation, okay? I go out there, tap on the guy's window, I strike up a conversation with him, and then I say, hey, in a moment, your wife's going to be coming out of the greenhouse, and she's going to have more than sweet corn. But these hydrangeas are on sale. It's a special, and they're gorgeous. And I agree with her. She should purchase these hydrangeas. So after I smooth things over with him, then I get on the walkie-talkie, and I call back into the garden center, and I say, okay, you can send her out. And she comes out of the greenhouse with her hands in the air, one of the employees pushing the cart of hydrangeas. It was like a hostage negotiation. But we were successful. See, I, I was thinking where this was going was that, like, you guys were pushing out, like, five carts full of hydrangeas. And, you know, and yeah. just kidding. No, it's just three. And he would be relieved then, and it would seem so much better than, you know. Oh, it's so much fun. I yeah. I mean, I've done this type of counseling my whole life, selling plants, and it's a good time. So I had to share that story with you. Okay. Well, I hope she's happy with her new hydrangeas. I think she will be. They, uh, she seemed thrilled. Fall has only just begun, but it's not too soon to look ahead to winter. We talked about the oak mast, but what about El Nino? El Nino. El Nino is my friend. I mean, I know on the West Coast, it's a pain. It rains. It's cold down South. But here in the Midwest, here in Michigan, I'm expecting to wear shorts this winter. Oof. I'm expecting to garden this winter. Now, of course, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm a meteorologist. But I'm hoping that this El Nino thing happens because in past years, when they've said El Nino and it's happened, it's been warm in the Midwest. Yeah, I know we have sort of a more unpredictable El Nino effects. Yeah. It could it could mean anything. Right. So, right. you know, I, I try not to think about it too much because you just kind of have to deal with it. And I don't want to get my hopes up. And uh, winter is not my favorite. So. And that's what it is with me, too. It's just hopes. I'm about as reliable as, you know, some of these reports. But I'm keeping my fingers crossed, okay? So I wrote you a little poem. Oh, the weather, oh. It, it, and it relates to Christmas because I love it. Uh, well, so everybody wants snow that's for Christmas. That's why they call it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but here in the north, it's delightful. Wearing shorts when it's supposed to snow, El Nino, El Nino, El Nino. It doesn't show signs of stopping. It's warm. The temps aren't dropping. From Minneapolis to Buffalo, El Nino, El Nino, El Nino. Yeah, Stacy, I'm planning on gardening this. Well, week. you're a musician. I think you should set that to music, and you could, I might you could do make that. it the next classic. <laughs> I might do that. And then, of course, when it comes to fall, uh, there's things we look for. Of course, Starbucks pumpkin spice latte just turned 20 years old this past Oh, my gosh. 20 years. I've never had one of you. Uh, Once. Oh, yeah? Did you like it? It's okay. (laughs) 
And there's some people who absolutely oh, yeah. love it. They go bananas. And the pumpkin spice loaf at Costco. I mean, all this stuff, you're starting to see this in stores. But also, you see the big pumpkins and the big gourds. And I always follow this harvest festival in the UK. They have all kinds of categories for giant or long vegetables. Eight world records set this past year, including the world's largest runner bean leaf, heaviest runner bean, tallest tomato plant, longest loofah, heaviest bell pepper, heaviest cucumber, heaviest broad bean, and longest broad bean. There's a guy who brought along a 49-pound cabbage. Holy macaroni. Yeah. That's a big cabbage. So we're going to put this link on the website so you can take a look at it. Now, the massive pumpkin that won this year, and I want to make sure to get this right, they brought it in on a forklift, 1,000 three hundred and seventy three pounds wow that's a big one now we've broken the ton mark here in the u.s yes as a matter of fact it fell far short of the guinness world record for heaviest pumpkin pumpkin which was two thousand seven hundred pounds every year we break that record so i'm excited to see where that ends up here in the u.s this year yeah so we're going to put that link there and uh, you'll be able to see some of these uh vegetables and fruits they had a 131.4 pound butternut squash which was dubbed the world's biggest at uh, a veggie way off at the state fair of virginia this past week uh, also so it's the time of year for big squash big pumpkins big vegetables we're reaping, uh, we're reaping an amazing harvest. So it's just fun stuff. You know, those squashes are hard enough to cut when they're normal size. Yeah. What kind of knife would you even use to cut that thing? A chainsaw? A chain, you'd have to. You'd have to have it like nice and clean so you could still use it, the squash afterwards. But, man, that is one of the dangerous things of fall is trying to cook with a squash. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for tuning in the Gardening Simplified show and go to our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And Stacy, we're on Instagram too. We are on Instagram, Gardening Simplified show. Fantastic. Thank you, Stacy. Thank, thank you. you, Adriana. And thank you to all of you for tuning in the Gardening Simplified show. <laughs>